This lecture is going to be on security, surveillance, and privacy. So this is all of the people who are collecting information about you, about your sources, about the things that you cover, who's collecting it, what they're doing with it, and uh, how you can protect yourself from that. Unfortunately, like most of the things that we talk about, this is an outrageously complicated topic. But I'm going to try to give you enough to start thinking about it. And I'm also going to give you uh, a basic framework for figuring out what you need to protect and how you can figure out how to protect it. So we're going to start with this question. Who can read your email? Uh, and generalize this, right? We're going to talk about email specifically, just to, to make it concrete. But uh, email, IM, Skype, text message. Um, any communication which you think is private uh, isn't. They're, it's very hard to do private communication on the internet. Uh, but, but this example will show maybe where it's intercepted and who might want to intercept it. So we have to start with the technical possibilities. So how a message is actually transmitted from one user to another. And this varies based on the protocol. Email is interesting because it's distributed. There's, there's two servers here, which I've called foo and bar. Um, if you're just doing instant messages, there's probably only one server, depending. Different protocols have, have different things. But the general pattern is going to hold, right? You've got someone at one end who's communicating with someone at the other end. And it takes some number of steps through the public internet, goes to a server, possibly several servers, and then through the public internet again, back to the other person. Email was designed a very long time ago. It was designed without regard to security at all, really. Uh, the protocols date from the 80s. And the first thing you should know is that email is plain text. So think of email as sending a postcard. A lot of people have to handle that postcard as it goes from one place to another. And any of those people could stop and read it. So that's the first thing. Second of all, it's stored in a lot of places. That's what I've shown by this little putting this little M here. Uh, it has to be stored in the course of normal processing, because email you know, has to store it and then forward it to the next place. Now, that means you have to ask the question, how long is it stored? And then you have to ask, well, who can get at it if it's stored? And there's various. Obviously, somebody who works for one of these companies running the server can do it. But if you're outside of that company, there are various legal means. So this kind of illustrates the basic things you have to think about in any communication system. Where is it being transmitted through? Can the people who handle it during transmission read it? Uh, who is storing it? For how long? Who has access to both the interception, so through the transmission, and to the material once it's stored? A lot of the surveillance that happens is secret. Uh, it's happening mostly at the state level, that is to say national governments. There's starting to be a little bit of transparency, at least in some countries, about who has access to this data and how often. So we're starting to see get things like, here you go, cell phone car carriers 1.3 million demands for subscriber information. So over a million times in the United States in uh, 2011, the phone company gave some of your information to a law enforcement agency. That doesn't specify whether that's, you know, could be local police or state, national, could be FBI, who knows. And we're actually, th unfortunately, this is the best case. This is the, this is the best transparency that we have on mass communication surveillance at this time. We're starting to get a few numbers, just a trickle of numbers, how often the, the big service providers, so telecommunications companies, um, big, big providers like Google, people who run social networks. As you'll see, there's a lot of different people who handle your data. And we're just starting to see the merest outline of how often they're actually giving it to someone else. So this would be a great um, story, by the way, 
uh, if you can manage to get the data for it. You know, you, you can take a Chinese province and say, how many times did the uh, police read email? Or, you know, maybe it's not even a sensible question. Maybe there's no legal restraint on it. But just to start asking questions about, well, how often are they watching? Another thing that people don't generally realize is that to operate, the way that a mobile phone works is it communicates with a nearby tower. That means that as you move, it has to connect to different towers. And usually, actually, it's in range of several of them at once. Because of that, the phone's position is triangulated. In fact, it has to be triangulated quite precisely to within uh, a few meters because of the speed of light. Uh, for the phone company tower to m keep synchronized with your phone, because they use a very high-speed communication protocol, it has to know what the delay is between transmitting and it reaching your phone. And if you have that delay from three different towers, you can triangulate. So actually built into the GSM protocol is a very accurate location device. And this is actually, it's used for lots of legitimate things. It's used for emergency response. So if someone makes a call, it's possible that a telecommunications company can work out where that person's phone is if they make a call to emergency services. But that means it's also tracked and recorded. So in you know, the last 15 years, we've gone to a situation where everybody's movement is being tracked all the time. And this is incredibly powerful, especially when combined with other types of information. This is a visualization made by, what, what happened is a, a European politician filed a freedom of information request to the telecommunications company that he used for his mobile service and said, I want all of the data that you have on me. So all of the phone calls that were made, all of the text messages, all of the positional information, so the tower information, for uh, you know six months here. And what you can see is that it's a complete record of where he was. So there he's driving. I'll speed this up a little bit. And then if you correlate that with social media and other data, like here you go, source Twitter, you can actually work out exactly where he, what he did and where he was at any given moment. He's m normally in Berlin, so I'll zoom into Berlin a little bit. So you can, we have no imagery here. Oh, that's weird. I don't believe you. Uh, where's the stop button? Oh, well. Oh, because the, the, I forgot to turn the Wi-Fi on again. There you go. So there it is. And you can, you can see the accuracy of the data. There he is walking around the streets. There he is taking a cab. So all of this is being recorded for every single person using a phone. The phone companies store it for different lengths of time. Uh, it's not consistent. Even within the same country, some phone companies store it for 180 days, some for 30 days. There's some laws setting minimum standards because the police want to be able to know that they can retrieve back to some number of days. Other than that, there's a huge amount of variation. And this is really the the theme of a lot, we're a lot of what we're going to talk about. It's actually very hard to know exactly who has data on you and how long they're keeping it. OK, phones. Uh, you can do things with phone records that you might not, with location data generally, that you might not think about. For example, if you have everyone's location data, you can see who's meeting with whom. I can work out exactly who this person met with for months on end. Now think about this as a journalist working with sources. If you're a journalist working with, let's say, Chinese activists, and you are going around to meet with all of them, all that 
whoever has access to this data needs to do to figure out who all of the Chinese activists are is figure out which phone numbers are in the same place as you on a regular basis. And then they know everybody else. That's even if you never call them. So the short version of that might be, if you're going to meet with someone and you don't want to leave a, record, leave a record of it, leave your phone at home. OK, phones, tracking devices. There are, of course, legitimate reasons to record this data. There's uh, legitimate reasons for governments and law enforcement to mine it, uh, to read your emails, this sort of thing. The question is not so much should this data be collected at all. In fact, it would be very hard for it not to be co collected. There would have to be very strong laws stipulating that the data is destroyed very quickly. But how often is it disclosed to someone else? And so there's an emerging best practice, uh, which you can see here, the Google Transparency Report, which is companies that have a lot of this data uh, have, in my opinion, an obligation to tell you how often they give it to someone else. So here's globally how many requests they've processed and how many cases they've said yes. You can see the number of requests are going up, but the number of times they hand over data is actually going down. Um, so pick a country here. What country do you want to look at? Hong Kong? <laughs> Seems reasonable. There you go. Unsurprisingly, the number of requests are, are going up here. So they actually have teams of lawyers. There's uh, dozens, possibly hundreds of people now employed by Google Worldwide handling these requests. Because they get, you know, 255 of them looks like per six month period. So that means they get a couple a day. And the lawyers, you know, this is, this is if, like Google, they have both the resources and the will to examine and possibly challenge each request. So if you're lucky, they have lawyers turning people down, and they're publishing how often they say yes. Twitter started doing this too. In fact, not just for um, user information requests, and they also tell you it's kind of neat. It's how many accounts they had to deal with, right? So look at this. It's like 10 except for Japan the U and the US, right? The US has, government asked for 948 different users. Um, they also tell you uh, DMCA takedown notices. So how often they removed something because somebody said it violated copyright. And Twitter's approach, because laws vary in different jurisdictions as to what be online. So in Germany, for example, you can't have um, things that are pro-Nazi, right? There's very strict hate, spe hate speech laws. And there's various laws in other countries. In Thailand, uh, you can't insult the king. But it varies in different jurisdictions. So what they do is they'll take it down in that jurisdiction. But if you're outside that country, you can still see it. And they also file a report to chillingeffects.org. Are you all familiar with chilling effects? OK. This is, uh, I mean, it's a site. It has some information. But mostly what it has is a record, a database, huh, which uh, apparently is not online right now. It has this huge database of all of these cases where somebody took something off. So you can file things to this, this too. Uh, and then at least we have a record that something was removed from the internet. But of course, in many contexts, there's no transparency. We have no idea who's keeping this information for how long or what it's being used for. There's also really, really underdeveloped law about who can get it legally. So uh, it's actually conflicting. There's an old law in the US. The, the laws covering data privacy in the US are very old, and they say, you know, if if the information's more than 180 days, it's not private anymore. But this, this is when people were thinking about, like, um, I don't even know, like, addresses or um, 
what were they thinking about? I guess they figured, you know, this is before everybody lived their whole lives online, right? This is a generation ago now. They weren't thinking that all of your communications would be there. Um, there was one case, the Sixth Circuit, which is region, regional, it's like five states, where the judge ruled, yes, you have to. The Department of Justice, following law about postal mail, says that if it's been opened, you don't need a warrant to read it, right? So if, you, if you're uh, in somebody's house and there's a letter lying around, then you can pick it up and read it without the warrant if you're a cop. If, but if it's sealed, then you need a warrant to open it. Following that logic, they say, if the person has read it, it's opened, and then we don't need a warrant to read it. Case law is very inconsistent, still being worked out. This is going to make it to the Supreme Court someday. In fact, there's a, there, there's a bill which is, keeps being proposed and is slowly working its way through the system, which would require a warrant to read email in all cases. Uh, the Department of Justice, the DHS, um, and the FBI are uh, opposing that. They, and they also want mandatory laws to keep your data longer. Um, and this is just legal reading, right? This is, I need a warrant to read it. This is, never mind the blanket surveillance that the NSA is doing, which we'll get to. Uh, then we have the issue of, you know, do you need a warrant to track someone on your phone? And um, the reality is that everybody disagrees on that still. And there was a recent uh, FOIA campaign that the ACLU did in the U.S. to ask police departments whether they obtained a warrant before doing it, and they were sort of split evenly about whether they thought they needed one. There is a, an interesting piece of case law in the U.S. as a, a court case that happened last year, which says that you need to put, you need to get a warrant to put a tracking device on someone's car, even though that car is going to be driving around on public streets. So in principle, you know, you can, you can stand there and watch the car drive down the road, but if you're going to record all of their movements or put a tracking device, you still need a warrant. This is very interesting. It, the court addressed the issue of how easily you could get the information or how complete the information was. The, the question of whether you need a warrant to get somebody's past location, which will basically tell you everything about their life, you know, say their cell phone data, is still unresolved. Uh, my hope is that this will go to the Supreme Court within the next couple of years, and citing Jones as precedent, they'll follow that line of argument and say, yes, this is personal data. Of course, this is the American case, and other countries are different. Most countries aren't even this far along. Most countries, it's just completely murky who has access and how. Uh, and then there's the issue of not, not, not the data. So the data about my location is already on another computer. Data about my email is already on another computer. There's, then there's a question of if, you know, the, the, if you're arrested or someone, the police have a warrant to search your house and they find your phone, can they unlock my phone and read everything on it? Which is a different question entirely. That's also unsettled. Some courts have said yes, some have said no. The U.S. has a law which says that the NSA, the National Security Agency, and the CIA can't spy on American citizens. They're doing it anyway. Um, the, a bunch of people have left the uh, NSA and have talked about the programs that are involved. We know that there's massive email uh, taps at, um, that the telecommunications companies are cooperating with them. Um, New York Times in 2006 broke the story about the warrantless wiretapping program, which is the, another name for what they're doing. Um, apparently, th there have been FOIAs requesting the sort of legal justification for this, like, you know, give us your internal legal memos on what's, what you're allowed to do. Uh, the government is refusing to release those memos. So, you know, there is a law, there is a legal theory that you're using, but you can't know what it is. Um, <coughs> From uh, reports from people who have left, apparently their legal theory is that collecting all of this information isn't spying on people. It's only when they look at it. I find that a bit weak. The other problem with that is that you can do things like social network analysis, which we talked about. And even if you use the information in the aggregate, that can still be individually incriminating. And you can, you can see some of this. How many of you followed the, uh, the recent, the, the downfall of General Petraeus? former CIA director, right? So 
you know, that started as an investigation into harassing emails to someone else, right? It was this woman who was being harassed by Paula Broadwell, and then they traced it to Paula Broadwell, and then then they discovered she was communicating with the CIA director, right? He wasn't, they were, it was completely accidental. And so in most areas of law, you can't, uh, you can't do that. You can't just have drag, dragnet surveillance. Um, but again, it depends on the country. And part of this is about establishing international norms and a legal framework. Can you run a data mining algorithm on a whole country's email to try to find criminals. Is that a thing that's going to be legal? I find this, um, I find this sort of terrifying, actually. The, the surveillance state arrived and sort of nobody noticed. And these questions are still very unsettled. There was an interesting blog post. It had a really nice, really nice title. It said, data is the civil liberties issue of our generation. We just don't know it yet. And there's a whole industry around it. In fact, the industry is very openly about illegal surveillance of entire populations. Check this out. The Unispeed Mass Surveillance Program, so this is a piece of hardware, is designed to perform intensive communication, surveillance, monitoring, and evidence gathering. Check this out. In situations where regulatory data retention and lawful interception does not provide for sufficient proactiveness, accuracy, or trending to counter the challenges. So right there, what they're saying this is designed for illegal surveillance of entire populations. They're, they're, you know, now, you can't sell this in the US because they have laws. But look at that. Regulatory, regulatory data retention and lawful interception does not provide. So if it's not regulatory data retention and it's not lawful interception, it's by definition illegal. Uh, so there's, you know, we know that they're selling it to um, a lot of the, the sort of bad actors internationally, right? We know that that you know, um, Syria and uh, Libya um, before Gaddafi was killed, and you know, um, North Korea and Iran. Like we know, we know about all of that. There's a huge market selling this sort of thing to China as well, but a lot of governments that you wouldn't think are doing this sort of thing actually are. Pretty much every government in the world is now doing this. It just the, their approach to talking about it and the laws in which they feel they're operating differ. At least in the UK, they tried to pass a bill that said, we're the UK government and we can, we can intercept all your email, uh, which failed, thankfully. The American situation is to sort of you know, sneak around it. Uh, most countries just don't even talk about it. They just assume they have the right to surveil everybody's information all the time. And it's going to get worse, both because surveillance technology is improving and because more of our lives are going to go online as we start to store more and more personal data, right? I, what, what I think about is, is two technologies which will eventually happen. Um, one is, at some point, your Bluetooth headset is going to go under your skin and you're going to have a communications implant. When that happens, you're going to have, uh, essentially, you're going to have augmented memory. Already, I can look up something faster than I can recall it from lo long-term memory in many cases. If it takes you half a minute to remember something and it takes you 10 seconds to look it up in your files or look it up on Wikipedia, then effectively that your electronic devices are your long-term memory. So when that happens, we're not just talking about intercepting someone's communications. We're talking about intercepting their thoughts. Uh, the, other, the other thing that's going to get very interesting is when, when you have this type of system and communication, I mean, I am is already pretty intimate, but what if it gets easier and easier? So the most likely candidate for this is subvocalization. You can put a microphone on someone's throat or say build it into the implant that's in your skull. If you talk uh, basically without voicing, there is enough audio there that you can do speech recognition. So that and maybe touch technologies, various types of things. You know, direct neural implant, like I think about it and then I can type it, that's a ways off, although that's coming too. You can now control wheelchairs and that sort of thing. But there's various options for um, rapid uh, sort of personal, that is to say not, you know, not making sound uh, I am. And at that point, it's essentially telepathy. And so people are going to start using that very, very intimately 
And so there's the question of what, what happens with that data too. It sounds like science fiction, but you know, I'd say that's happening inside 10 years, and then there becomes the question of, well, who has access to my mind? That's, that's the way I think of it. Then, of course, there's the issue of censorship. Th this is being tracked uh, most carefully by the Open Network Initiative. Uh, one of the interesting things that they do is they, have, they look at different types of censorship, so political, social, conflict, or security. Uh, they, different parts of the world are worried about different things. In the Middle East, they're more, mostly worried about the social category, you know, religious uh, insults, pornography, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, and of course in China, they're mostly worried about um, the political speech. But it's more than you think, and most countries are moving towards it or have tried to. Like, uh, have any of you heard of the clean feed? That was uh, a law in Australia, which was also defeated recently, which was um, the idea is that it would create a blacklist of internet sites. And normally the argument, the, the wedge issue is child pornography, right? The argument is we have to be able to remove things from the web because of child pornography. But of course, whenever the blacklist sites leak, they always have, invariably, there's other things on there. Uh, there was also SOPA in the US. You guys heard of that? Remember that one? Some, of, some nods. That was intended, actually, that was pushed through by the, uh, the copyright lobby, basically. So they sites wanted the ability to make it easy to take down entire sites that had infringing material. Uh, which is interesting uh, because copyright is not a criminal law, it's a civil law. Normally if you don't like what somebody's doing you can sue them or there's the DMCA procedure where you send a takedown notice. Um, but taking someone's entire site off the net is uh, it's pretty drastic. Normally it's the, the sort of thing that you only happens after a court decision when you get an injunction or, or you know, by, by police order. Uh, but that was defeated as well. Anyway, um, every, pretty much every uh, country in the world with any sort of internet sophistication has now tried to censor the internet or produce uh, an internet censorship bill in some way. Uh, which uh, countries like China point to and say, see, uh, the West is censoring the internet too. Of course, the, the problem with that argument is it's a matter of degree. It's, uh, it's fairly easy to show that there's way more censorship in China than, than in other parts of the world. And that's what this map does. It just tracks that. It only tracks whether websites are reachable, though. It doesn't talk about the internal censorship where things are deleted. So yeah, everybody has your data. It's not clear what they're going to do with it or when, on what the legal restrictions are about that. And also, many countries in the world are uh, blocking what you get to see or say. Good times. There are things that you can do. Now, we're not going to talk about the censorship issue more tonight. That's a, that's a whole other story. But we're, we are going to talk about privacy and security because we're going to talk about what you as journalists can do to protect yourself and protect the people that you work with. And this is really important. How many of you saw um, this last week the, the, the New York Times uh, was subject to a bunch of attacks? Right. You, you, that was you? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> that was you, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, so big deal, right? So that's very high profile because it's you know China versus the New York Times. It's you know clash of the titans, right? Uh, but the truth is that this sort of thing happens all the time. Journalists are targets. M almost more than most professions, they are targets for people who want to know things that you know. They are targets because they, um, well, basically because they keep secrets. Anytime you learn something on background, anytime you choose not to reveal the name of a source, all of the things, and those of you who have been in this business a while and run a few stories, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of things that you can't say. People want to know those things. And also, you're targets because, in many cases, you are reporting on powerful interests. And unfortunately, unlike, say, 
people in finance who know their targets and have a lot of money and are relatively sophisticated, journalists by and large are not yet very savvy about this. So they're both targets and they're also unshielded targets. And this is a bad state of affairs and maybe the result is you get, you know, your news organization gets sued. But maybe the result is somebody gets killed if you work in a conflict zone and the, the people with the guns have been able to identify who you're talking to. So there's varying degrees of consequence. But there are tools. A lot of them are based on cryptography. And so the next thing we're going to do is talk a little bit about the technology of cryptography and how it works. First of all, what's, what's, what's encryption? It's, on the, it's up there on the slide. Why, do we, why would we encrypt something? What's the point? Yeah, so only the intended recipient can read it. Uh, how do we accomplish that? How is that even possible? Right, secret, secret codes, right? So, so secret writing, cryptography means secret writing. It's been around for thousands of years. Uh, it became far more powerful and interesting in the 20th century with the advent of computers. Although it was actually done before that. The Enigma machine, have any of you heard of that? World War II mechanical encryption device, uh, which was broken by the very first mechanical computers at, in Britain and the US. Um, in fact, that's one of the reasons computers were originally built, was to do that during World War II. So the basic idea is that there's some, the, the most basic type of cryptography is that there's a secret that the two ends who want to communicate know, and they use that to scramble the information so that no one else can read it. What about when you log on to your banking website? Is that information encrypted? Or you log into your email. Anyone know? Can anyone read the information? Because remember, when you log on to your bank website, the bank's computer is sending you the information on all your accounts over the public internet. So anybody who, you know, the telecommunications company could record that information, or, you know, I can go into a closet and plug in my laptop and connect to the university network and monitor all the packets that are being sent on the network. So is that, is that information secure when I, when I uh, log into my bank? It's secure in transit, but it's not secure on the local machine, on your own machine. Yeah, OK, secure in transit. What does that mean? So I mean, once it's on the public internet, it's encrypted. It is encrypted. Ah, but we didn't agree on a key. So how can we do that? I didn't, I didn't walk into the bank and say, here's my secret code. <laughs> use this whenever I log into your site. Anyone know the answer to this? It's generated well, it's generated every time, but, but then how do we both know it? Some kind of, some kind of what? Protocol. Yes, some kind of protocol. So the, so the bank can make up a, an encryption key, but then I have to know that key, so it would have to send it to me. But we don't have a secure channel, so it would have to send it to me unencrypted. So that doesn't work. Uh, you mean public, private? Yes. Encryption. Public key cryptography. Public key cryptography is damn well near magic. It's one of those things that seems like it's impossible. But public key cryptography has created the modern world. It's one of these technologies that is fundamental because it would be basically impossible to secure the web without it. I mean, it's still kind of impossible to secure the web. But we would have really no hope at all. Public key cryptography is, is deep magic. It's how two people who uh, have to yell across a crowded room so that everyone else can hear them can have a secret conversation. Does anyone know how it works? Some prime numbers? Yeah, there's some prime numbers involved. Really big prime numbers? <laughs> Although that's, yeah, um, yeah, very big prime numbers. That's, that's actually. That's actually only one way to do it. There's, 
there's a more fundamental concept. And it's, it's one of these just insane things. So I'm just actually, I'm going to show you a video about how this works. Because I finally found a good, uh, good explanation of it. Hopefully this will come out loud enough. Or at all. Hello. So, Caitlin, I'm sorry you lost out on that because uh, because I got I got it right. But at least you know that we're both being honest about it. Send it the right? chocolate. And because because you're being honest, I'm going to give you this chocolate. Well, you got to send it over whoa, the internet. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You're in New York. I'm in Vast party. ocean. Can oh, I get can I get one, two, two, three, four people up, please? Yeah. And just stand across. Yeah. Okay. So these people are the internet. <coughs> and in a line this way. Yeah, in a line that way. Yeah. So that's all hot for the cameras. All right. Okay, so Can if I want to send this chocolate to Caitlin, I've got to send it through the internet. And I can't... This guy looks shifty. <laughs> um, so how am I going to do it? Chuck it? No, I can't chuck it because Caitlin's in New York. You're in New York. No, no, no. I'm in Christchurch. Caitlin's in New York. It's very prestigious. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it inside this box. All right? And I'm going to reach into my pocket and I'm going to pull out a padlock. Okay? How convenient. Okay. So I'm going to lock the box so that no one on the internet can get Caitlin's chocolate. Please send this to Caitlin, all right? And say that to the person next to you. <laughs> okay, so now Caitlin has the chocolate. Hooray! The, yeah, the only problem is that the chocolate is inside a locked box. And Caitlin, do you have the key to my locked box? No, you don't. All right. So how are we going to solve that? Send the key over. But what if this guy's just kept the box? Then I give him the key. Well, Caitlin's, Caitlin's got the box, but I don't know that because the only, the only way I can get a message from Caitlin to me is if Caitlin passes that message back, back down through these people. All right? So if this guy says, I'm Caitlin, I've got the box, all right, <laughs> and then I send the key, he's kept the box, he's got the key, he's got the chocolate. So that's, that's not fair. So I'm going to hold on to the key. This is my key, and I'm not letting it go. I have a solution. Okay, Hub. Okay, if, Kate, if Caitlin gets her own key... Caitlin's got her own lock. Her own padlock. Okay. I'll just send it back. So you, you tell the person next to you, please send this to Matt, because that's how the internet works. All right, so I'm just going to unlock the box and get my chocolate back. <sighs> yep. Ah. So there's an extra lock on the box now. Um, but it's unlocked, so now I can just say, please send this to Caitlin. And because Caitlin's got the key... And so the chocolate song goes. And now Caitlin safely has the chocolate without anyone in the middle being able to attack. Internet, thank you. You can sit down. So that's the metaphor. And real systems involve prime numbers, and there's sort of gets a little more complicated. But that was the fundamental insight, was that you use two keys. Each person has a key. And uh, I mean, th there's variations, but there's, there's sort of three or four fundamental ways that are known to do this. And they, they all work on this kind of scheme. So we can solve this problem. I can have a conversation with somebody through any number of intermediaries, having never exchanged a secret key, 
that they can't intercept. Well, they can intercept, they can't read it. It's going through them. There's still a problem, and I'm going to talk about the problem in some detail because it's actually at the basis of uh, both modern attacks, like real things that are happening on the internet, and also I'm going to try to convince you not to ignore a crucial feature of the tool that I'm going to recommend you use, because it, it, the reason it has this feature is to fix this problem. So, I've written two things. Uh, encryption is making sure that someone in the middle can't read it. Authentication is making sure that they sent it. So one of the problems with public key encryption is that someone in the middle, if I say, you know, again, please pass this box to Caitlin, right? Somebody in the middle could say, I'm Caitlin, and um, just take over that entire end of the transaction, use their own key, and I never get to see their key, so I don't know it's not them. So there are actually two different problems. This is sort of what we imagine, right? It, it prevents the, the, the bad guy in the middle from, from getting this message. And it does, but um, if you don't have authentication, you can just do this. So A encrypts it, Alice encrypts it with her key, sends it to E, so this is traditional. Allison and Bob are the endpoints, and then E is Eve, who's the eavesdropper. If you ever read a cryptography paper, they always use this notation. <laughs> so Eve, uh, substitutes her key and also changes the message. But B thinks it's still A's key because you don't have authentication. You don't know where it comes from. Now, if you are also at some point sending keys across to each other, which is actually what happens. Uh, public key cryptography is, is, is kind of a slow algorithm. So what you do is you set up that connection. And then instead of sending the whole message that way, you send a one-off key. And then you both have a shared secret. And then you use that secret to communicate from that point on. It's a minor detail, except that if you can get in the middle of that first connection, then you have the key that they use for all of the other communication. Uh, this is known as a man in the middle attack for obvious reasons. Everyone see how this works? Right? So the the man in the middle could be anyone. It could be the telecommunications company. It could be your boss. It could be the, um, you know, the opposing side of the war that you're on. It, it could be, you know, it doesn't matter. The point is there's somebody that you want to keep secret from and you're going to fail. And not only do you fail in keeping it secret, but they can change the message. So this happens. This really happens. Um, there's a bunch of it's a bunch of things Iran is doing right now, uh, Syria as well, a few other countries, where what they do is they so the, the and these are cases where the state runs all the telecommunications companies. So the Iranian telecommunications company, every time you go to Facebook, you have to go th over a network that they own because they own all of the telecommunications companies and all the links out of the country. Uh, same with China, of course. So they can replace your connection to Facebook to, to, to go through them first. And there's all sorts of things they can do with that. In fact, what they were doing with it was they were connecting the logins of activists. And although normally when you go to Facebook, OK, watch this. See this? HTTPS. Who knows what that means? SSL. OK, so what does SSL mean? Yeah, it's a, secure it's a secure connection. What it's done is it just in that moment where I went to the site, it did that, that uh, public key exchange. And now I have a secure connection. Unless someone along the way, say the Iranian telecommunications uh, company, has stuck itself in the middle. And so now what's actually happening is all my communication is going, is going, even though it's encrypted, they're decrypting it, watching what's going on, and then re-encrypting and sending it to Facebook. So Facebook thinks it's talking to me. I think I'm talking to Facebook. In fact, we're both talking through the, the telecommunications company. So what do you think they do with this? Why do they bother? What do they want?
yeah, they want your password. Mostly what they'll do is they'll record when you log in, they'll record that password, and then the Iranian secret police have the passwords for the Facebook accounts of all the activists, and they can see who they're talking to, and then you can do that one at a time by following their friends, and you can build up the social graph, and if you, if you can build up the social graph, you, inst you don't just know who one person is, you know who everybody is. They can find, they can do complete surveillance of an entire counter movement by, uh, if, by this technique. And are, and did. And people were thrown in jail. In Syria, people get shot. So how do we solve this man in the middle problem? How do I know that who I think I'm talking to is actually who I'm talking to? You bypass the, those pipes that belong to you. You can't. You're stuck in the country. Right? So the, one of the fundamental assumptions of cryptography is that the attacker controls the communication channel. Otherwise, you would have your own communication channel already, and you wouldn't need cryptography. Uh, that's how that's how public key encryption works. It's yeah. You have to have some way to prove that who you're talking to is really who they're talking to. There's there's two solutions in wide practice actually. Certificates. What's a certificate? Yeah, you need you need some. They need to give you something that only they would have. So how this is done for websites is. When I want to put a site on the internet that uses HTTPS, I have to register with this thing called the Certificate Authority, which is a company like uh, VeriSign, or um, uh, there's a bunch of them. That um, and there's a couple hundred of them worldwide. There's really, I mean, there's a lot, but really not that many. Um, that I'm a particular person, and what they give me is they take my information, they do some cursory check to make sure I am who I really say I am. Usually it's very cursory, which is part of the problem. But you know, it's, if someone, they find out pretty fast if someone registers a Facebook certificate who's not Facebook, right? Because then Facebook calls and says, like, uh, someone else is using a certificate with our name on it. So the, the thing is, they have the power to revoke the certificate. And, what this, and then I, they give me a certificate. And what the certificate is, is it's uh, a cryptographic code, it's signed. The certificate authority has signed it and said, yes, we checked, this is really Facebook. And what a, the, anyone can decrypt that signature and say, oh yes, the, the VeriSign really made this. But no one can forge it. That's what a cryptographic signature is. It's uh, something that everybody can check, but no one can forge. It's another use of cryptography. And then every web browser has a list of all of the, the public keys needed to check the signature. So in, my, in Google Chrome, in Firefox, in Safari, in, all of, in Internet Explorer is uh, a list of the called root certificates uh, that they can use to check that the Facebook, the, the certificate I'm getting when I go to Facebook was actually issued by one of these certificate authorities. So you're still depending on trust, but now you've centralized the trust to a small number of institutions. So again, I go to Facebook. One of the things that happens is when we try to set up that connection, it says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before we exchange keys, give me your certificate. I want you to prove that you're actually Facebook. And the Iranian government can't do this because it doesn't have that certificate. And in fact, you can probably do, uh, let's see, developer tools. Where is it? I don't actually know how to get it. So then you need to click on the, on the lock icon. Oh, yeah, cool. I have a question, though. So maybe you'll, you'll go to that. Um, but what if somebody's hacked your browser? Or yeah, if someone, if, if someone, so in security in general, if someone has access to your computer physically, 
like you leave it in your hotel room and someone goes and uses it, all bets are off. Because my, my dad had a word that was reading the bank, replacing the, the bank HTML and it's secure. And it's just, it's already on the browser. Yeah, so, so, so yeah. So, so well, there is something you can do, is don't let other people have access to your computer. No, but it came in through non-secure connections and then hacked the browser and then ah, okay. then from the... Yeah, I mean, computer security is a real problem. Um, that's another thing is you have to be wary about running software. So every time you install, you, you must have seen this, you install a piece of software and ask you to type your password in. Every time you type your password in, you're giving that piece of software permission to do anything it wants, pretty much, to your computer. So you really got to think about when you're installing something, can I trust the person who wrote this software? Do I know that I got it from an authentic source? And I would also recommend that you keep a password on your laptop so that it times out to the screensaver. And I would also recommend disk encryption because even if you have a password on your laptop, all I need is a screwdriver and I can get to your drive. Uh, so most operating systems now have built-in disk encryption. Use it, really. There's, no, there's really no excuse not to have an encrypted drive at this point. Also, you have to encrypt your backups. We'll get to all of this later. One of the, one of the rules that uh, is important in all of this is keep track of how many copies and where they are and who can get them. But if you're serious on, about this, and you need to be serious about this because you are high-profile targets, you have to do all of this stuff. Two-way authentication. Yeah, so we'll do that in a second. Um, if you only take away um, one thing from this lecture, actually, no, it should probably be threat modeling. Okay, if you only take away two things, the second thing is this tool. This is a tool called off-the-record messaging. It's a protocol. There are plugins for uh, many major IM clients. A bunch of them have it built in. Not the same as off-the-record in Google Chat. You've probably seen this. I'll go off the record. Who knows what that actually does? Google Chat? Uh, the off the record option in Google Chat. And what? Yeah, but what, is it, what does it do when it's off the record? What does that actually mean? Right. It means it doesn't record your messages. So. What's that? Uh, is it really that's off well, so Google's not logging your messages, but they're still going through Google. Yeah. So this is different. The off the record messaging plugin, which is like, let's just go take a look at it. There you go. When in doubt, go to Wikipedia. It's this thing. And here are all of the clients that support it. Now, you still have to turn it on, and then you can do it with a plugin for a bunch more. You still have to turn it on, but when you do, and you set up the connection correctly, no one can intercept it. So an ideal security protocol, the thing about security is you always have to trust somebody. You, at minimum, have to trust the person you're talking to. You often have to trust somebody in the middle. Um, you have to trust the certificate authorities. Uh, in the case of HTTPS, there's always some trust involved. But the better security protocols are the ones that require you to trust fewer people. With off-the-record messaging on, on Google Chat, you have to trust Google. Now, maybe that's OK. We'll get into thinking about when that's OK later. But you should know there's an option that doesn't require you to trust anybody at all. You're setting up your very own end-to-end -end cryptographic communication, which is independent of HTTPS. It's independent of the certificate authority system. It's independent of everything. It's your very own secure communication line. So it's direct peer-to-peer -peer connection? Direct peer-to-peer, -peer, yeah. Okay. Um, it also does some really nice things. Uh, it, it has a thing called perfect forward secrecy, which means that if someone later figures out your private keys, say they, c they capture your laptop, and they read your private key file, they still can't read your old messages, even if they recorded the encrypted version, right? So if you just use a key and you do this the wrong way, I re can record all of your encrypted traffic. I don't know what it means, but then later I steal your laptop, I get your key, I can go back and read it. 
You can't do that with uh, OTR. It's really nicely done. You have to use it the right way. That means a lot of different things. One of the things it means, and we're, we're going to talk about the idea of security as habits, means you always have to use it. I know that sounds stupid, but every time you, you know, oh, just that one time, you know, oh, I'm using it over my laptop, and uh, it's not over Wi-Fi, it's a secure connection. Uh, even small amounts of information can be used to piece together a larger picture. You know this, you're journalists. The other thing is you have to do what, what you were talking about, Cedric, which is the, the, the out-of-channel communication to do the authentication, right? So if I just connect to my source, that first time when I set up the keys, when I exchange keys and I do this sort of whole public key thing, somebody could be in the middle there. So what I have to do is I have to use another communication channel to check that they actually got my key and it's my real key. So what we're trying to guard against is this is this key changing in the middle. So B thinks that they're looking at a message encrypted with A's key, but it's actually encrypted with E's keys. See, that's cyan instead of pink. To avoid that, what OTO does is it produces a, a fingerprint. A fingerprint is, is something derived from the key. And every person has a unique fingerprint. So when you set up OTO, you get a fingerprint. And then when you first connect to someone, see this purported fingerprint? this little dialog box will come up and say, this is the fingerprint they sent me over the internet. Why don't you call them up and ask them if that's really their fingerprint? And they'll match if you have a connection that, that nobody has tampered with. So the key idea here, it's called an out-of-channel verification. So this is, this is it. Right? You send that fingerprint through a different channel and the the, the eavesdropper would have to control both of those channels at once. So I often do it through a Twitter private message. Phone is fine. And the problem is, so I call my friend and I say, my fingerprint is 275C179 blah, 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 blah. Is that what you have for me? At that moment, if someone wanted to control this channel, they would have to change your voice into saying their fingerprint and not yours. Very difficult. We think impossible. So use OTR and don't ignore this. Right? You'll be tempted to just hit this button and be like, ah, oh, OK. You only have to do it once. You have to do it the first time you, s you add them as a contact and start a connection. And after that, it just saves their fingerprint. But this is better than PGP. This is better than, this is better than every other way of communicating uh, securely. This is, this is what I recommend if this is a problem that you have to solve. Now you should know it won't solve every problem. For one thing, anybody monitoring your communications will still know who you're talking to. They might not know what you're saying, but they'll know who you're talking to. That alone might be enough to get you or them into trouble. So beware of that. So it's not anonymous, but it is private. And that's how it works. So here's, here's the lessons of this section. Um, you have to understand the difference between encryption and, and authentication. They're different things. Uh, one way to think of it is um, you know, someone emails you a zip file with a password on it. OK, so you know that someone watching it, watching your, uh, you know that someone eavesdropping on your email, or you know, if someone gets a warrant and reads your email, they're not going to be able to get the contents of the file. Are you sure that the file came from the person you think it came from? That's the question you have to ask yourself. They're two different problems. Email is very easy to fake, by the way. That's one. The other thing is that this whole key setup thing, tricky. The best way to know that you've, got, you've really got a secure connection is when you meet someone face to face and you do this, this key exchange. You, know, you give them the password for the file on a piece of paper, or you do this, you, know, you both pull up your laptops and you set up the connection and you look over at each other's screen and you're like, okay, good. That's really the only perfect way to do it. 
Um, and if you don't do that, you can't prove that it's secure. And if you can't prove it's secure, then why bother? Right? You've, you, you know that you're vulnerable to attacks. And you not only know that you're vulnerable to attacks, you know that you're vulnerable to attacks that actually happen. Right? This is not theoretical. There are, there are you know, mostly state actors do this. And I'm sure China is doing this. I would be, yeah, of course they're doing this. Anyway, um, so they'll try to do it for Gmail, for example, right? That's, um, you know, that's one of the reasons Gmail is blocked is because uh, they are not able to look into that secure connection. And in fact, Google has taken extraordinary steps. Uh, the Chrome browser um, is even smarter than usual than usual about connecting to Google servers. They'll, they have always ways to spot fake certificates. OK, so I have hopefully scared you deeply at this point. The, uh, the next and last section of our course is uh, what to do, how to think about security. I've given you one tool, which is off-the-record messaging. And hopefully, I've given you enough theory to understand why you shouldn't ignore the uh, fingerprint verification step. Now we're going we're gonna to step back a little bit and look at much more general things. But we'll, we'll do the break. And uh, so 8 PM. During the break, two of you reminded me of um, things that should have been in my slides. Uh, first is Skype. Anybody know if Skype is secure? Yeah, partially on the edition. So, so what edition is the least secure? The forty plus demo, the Chinese edition. Right. Tom. Yeah. So the the, the it's isn't it Tom? Yeah. Tom, Tom Tom. Tom. Yeah. So the Chinese version is definitely insecure. Um, even the non-Chinese version, it, it is encrypted, but Skype has a master key. So, the question you have to ask yourself there is. Is Skype going to cooperate with someone who wants my data? And uh, they're not saying. Part of the problem with Skype is they won't talk about it. At least Google will talk about under what circumstances they'll give their information up. Skype, uh, now Microsoft, won't talk about it at all. The other thing is uh, two-factor authentication. We're going to actually look at this a little more in the context of passwords. Uh, but the reason you want, so, so what this is, is you know, you've probably, many of you have a, have a little uh, password generator for logging into the bank. I know HSBC does this. You can get the same thing for logging into your email, right? It's built into your phone. And that way, if your password is ever compromised, which is surprisingly common, uh, you still have some protection. So we'll talk about that a little more when we talk about passwords. OK, security and practice. I'm going to walk you through how the WikiLeaks cables became public. And I'm going to do this because I'm, first of all, it's kind of, I think it's kind of interesting, sort of the, the details of how that happened. But um, no one, as far as we can tell, meant this to be public. Neither Assange nor Lee wanted this file to become public. In fact, Assange was getting a lot of leverage after, out of having it private because he could then selectively release things. Right? They, released, they gave the quarter of a million cables to a small number of news organizations. But then after the news organizations reported on uh, a small number of them, they didn't release them all publicly. So he was able to hand them out. So it wasn't in his interest. So this was a phenomenal fuck up, basically, one of the biggest accidental disclosures in history, if not the biggest, by a guy who is one of the best hackers in the world. So how did this happen? Does anyone know this story? All right. This was the plan. Assange had M, the message, encrypted it with a password to create an encrypted message E 
put it up on a website, a secret website that only, it was not a password protected website, but only he knew the URL. It was a temporary site. It was up there for you know 24 hours or something. Lee downloaded the encrypted file, used the password, got back to the original message. The password was handed off face to face. They met in a cafe. He wrote the password on a napkin, gave it across. So like I said, very careful key exchange. They did all of this right. This is what Assange was thinking. This is the plan. After sending it across, you destroy the password. And then Eve, the attacker, even if they went to that secret URL or the file was leaked, all they get is the encrypted copy. They don't have the password. They can't read it. Anybody remember what happened next? Lee published the password in his book that he wrote about WikiLeaks. Why? Why did he think he could do that? Because he thought the site had gone down. Right, because he thought the site had gone down. So this is what Lee was thinking. Same scheme. But Lee thinks, well, 24 hours later, you know, uh, 24 hours after I download it, the site's going to disappear, so nobody can get this file. So nobody has a copy of an encrypted one, and everything's good. And so the password doesn't matter anymore because the file's gone. So what actually happened was two things. First of all, he published the password in a book. Second, uh, that original encrypted file made it into an archive of WikiLeaks material, which was released publicly. And then a, a few months later, somebody figured out that this file, it was called like, you know, uh, y.gpg or something. I forget. It's some weird file name. Somebody figured out what it was and that it could be decrypted by this password, which had already been printed in this book. So you combine the two of them, and that's how we got the cables. I actually reported on this story for the AP. I traced the history of all of this. And downloaded the file from the archive, typed in the password from the book, and got my very own copy of the, whoa. OK. Look at that. It reopened to the same place. Got my very own copy of the, the original cables. Who fucked up here? Anyone want to guess? There's been lots of blog posts blaming one side or the other for this. <laughs> what do you think? Both they both fucked up. Why? Okay, so maybe he w shouldn't have put it on a website. But on the other hand, we send all kinds of s secure information to the internet, right? We send our bank details. We send our, well, not our emails. They're private. But we do secure communication over the insecure internet all the time. Anyone else got an opinion? Right, so he, he's thinking that the so he's thinking this, right, that the URL is going to disappear, and the URL did disappear. It, no one downloaded it from the URL that we know of. Although someone could have. And I think also there's a case that Assange fucked up because uh, this should never have made it to the archive. Apparently, it was like one of the volunteers or something. Although he could have used a different password just for that one communication to get it to leave. This is one of the principles of cryptography is don't use a different password for each file. Use a different password for each communication. And don't ever reuse passwords, because that way, if one of the passwords gets leaked, you, uh, all of the others are still encrypted, right? If you'd use a different password for the one that went in the archive, then it would have been fine. So arguably, they both screwed up. Now, from a cryptography point of view, I would say don't ever leak a password. The whole point of having a password is it's the secret part. If you can get a file to somebody secretly, you don't need a password. So the password has to stay secret forever because you assume that someone is intercepting the encrypted communication. That's the point of encrypting it. right? That's the basic principle of cryptography. You assume 
that the communication is being intercepted and monitored and messed with. Otherwise, you wouldn't need cryptography. So I think you can make a case that Lee did the wrong thing. However, there's a different lesson I'm trying to draw from all of this, which is that security is complicated. There's a lot of details to it. There's a lot of, it relies on everybody doing exactly the right thing. And in practice, when security breaks down, it's not because somebody had a supercomputer and broke the codes. It's because somebody used a shitty password or they left their computer on with no password or they made a backup that they forgot about or they logged in that one time um, over an insecure connection and somebody got the password or they um, you know, wrote a message that was supposed to be anonymous from an anonymous account, but wrote, you know, mentioned where they lived, right? It's, it's always operational how security falls apart. And so a big challenge in your security plan, and this is your, your final homework, the, the, the thing that people seem to have the most trouble with is making a plan that's simple enough to be followed. Even this simple plan. I'm going to give you the password, you're going to download it, you're going to decrypt it. Failed because Assange, who designed the plan, didn't make sure that Lee understood how the, why the plan was supposed to be secure, right? So Assange is a cryptography professional. He's thinking this is how it works. But Lee assumed that it had to do with the URL. And he, you know, he was wrong. So let's talk about passwords. Uh, how many people use the same password on different sites? Right, so that's everyone. How many people use their email password on different sites for different things? Right, so you realize that if someone gets your email password, they have every other password? You see how that works? Because uh, the password recovery feature always uses your email. So at the very least, don't use your email password for anything except your email. The uh, problem is I keep forgetting it. Right. <laughs> I know. There's hundreds of them. So you, you should use a password manager then, uh, like 1Pass. Uh, <coughs> oh. it's, it's a program that lives on your machines, and it stores all your passwords for you and then you just have a master password that unlocks all the other ones. That's the solution to that. Or use... The easy thing, then you only rely on one password. Right. People know about that password. But it's easier to keep one password secret on your computer than it is to keep uh, ten password, you know, pa or one password secret on ten other people's computers. And also that one password, you never send that password over the internet. That's never transmitted. It just un unlocks your passwords for different sites which are transmitted. Also, people use terrible passwords. These are passwords from real password leaks. And one's from uh, Gawker, another one's from LinkedIn. Wow, password. <laughs> Rivaled only by one, two, three, four, five, six. My God, people. <laughs> and remember, once you're in one person's account, you can impersonate them, and you may be able to get other people to tell you their passwords. Other common ones. I see dragon and monkey make the top list on both sides. <laughs> uh, Shadow and Michael. Where's Shadow? There you go. Star Wars. <laughs> Gawker, which is a great password on the Gawker site, right? And then um, LinkedIn, which is a business site, has pussy way up there for some reason. Which, anyway, um, don't use passwords in the dictionary. Maybe they were keeping their email accounts secure by using different passwords. Maybe. Yeah, it's true. I've got a throwaway password that I use on things that I don't care about. 
But you know, I'd be willing to bet people's email passwords look like this too. And the thing is this, um, normally when a password file is breached, so a, you know, major companies, servers are hacked into, the password files released, the passwords are hashed, which means they're stored encrypted. But the way it works is, it's a, what a hash is is that you can take this password and turn it into this random data. And you can't reverse it, but you can go, you, it's a one-way function. You can turn something into a hash, but you can't go backward. And so how these systems work is when you type in your password, they take what you typed in, turn it into a hash, and they compare it to what's stored in the file. This is how you store passwords securely. You never store their original password. So, if, so by the way, if you call up tech support and they can give you your password, that's a tremendously bad sign. That means the passwords are being stored unencrypted or, c or can be unencrypted. You don't want that. If you, if you call up someone who's storing sensitive information, you ask them to give you your password, they should not be able to do it. Now, they can change your password. That's different. But they shouldn't be able to give you your existing password. That's a really bad sign. But anyway, even if these hashed passwords are released, all you have to do, you can guess the password because you can see when you hash it if it matches. So if it's a word in the dictionary, uh, all you have to do is run through all the words in the dictionary, which a computer can do in a couple minutes. So it's incredibly insecure to use a dictionary word. Don't for anything you care about. So you can make up complicated passwords. The best thing to do is this. Everything I need to know I learned from XKCD. They have a beautiful one on statistical significance. They just, they're s he's so smart. So make up a pass phrase of random words. Or um, the other thing you can do is make a longer phrase and then use the first word of each thing. But it's much better to just use a long password of, of random words than it is to try to make something up, especially because you're not going to remember it. Look at that. We've, through 20 years of effort, we've trained everyone to use passwords that are hard for humans to remember, but easy for computers to guess. So this is just a little calculation of how many bits it takes to represent all possible combinations. And that's related to how many tries a computer would take if it was trying all possible combinations. So you want more bits, because then the computer takes longer and longer to guess it. And automated password cracking won't work. But actually, that's not how passwords are normally compromised. In fact, 90% of the time, I don't even know actually. I'm, I totally made that number up. Uh, I don't think anybody knows. But the vast majority of the time when someone's account is compromised or hacked into, as you know, the, the slang likes to say, there's no, there's no real hacking involved. There's phishing, which is phishing is send me. <laughs> You send someone an email saying, please give me your password, and they say yes. That's what phishing is. Anyone seen a phishing email? Yeah? yeah? So here you go. Here's an example. <coughs> There's lots of ways you know you're receiving a phishing email. Normally, it looks really fishy. Um, but yeah, uh, if you ever get an email saying, please go and update your account, or basically an email telling you to go log in, don't. That's, that's the first sign. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> but that—that's but th true because their their some of their passwords are compromised. But did it tell you to type in your password? Yeah, it told me to go like, click this link and go to the website and reset the password. But resetting the password is not the same as. Yeah, no. Oh, it, that's it, true. It, it could still be it fake. It yeah. Could have then taken to a site and said type in your password. And right. So, other than you know horrible misspellings and etc. Or the other one, there's one going around on Twitter direct messages. It says, oh my god, have you seen this photo of you that's going around? <laughs> Anyone seen that one? Some of my friends have had that one. Beware of that stuff. Short, non-specific messages, weird spellings. Um, normally what they do is they go to a fake site. How do you put a fake site up? How do you make it look like a real site? Copy stuff over. Yeah, you can... You can um, just copy it. Um, we'll get to that in a second, actually. Let's do that first. Yeah, there you go. So it looks like Facebook, because they just copied the 
site and just cut and paste the code. It's easy. Uh, but look at the URL. The URL goes to the wrong place. And there's some other ones, right? This is not PayPal. Know how to read a URL. This is socialmediahub.com. <laughs> know how to read a URL. Um, if there's any ever, ever any question, read the URL. Um, so here's a, here's a phishing attack in the context where people's lives are at risk. And you will be attacked this way if you are doing journalism in a conflict zone. Like I said, a journalist is a high profile target. Everybody knows your name and you have a lot of secrets. So a very simple idea, right? All they did is they made up a message saying, oh God, you have to see this. But then when you click the link, you're like, oh, I forgot to log into Facebook or my, you know, most people don't think about it. And you get a fake login page and then they have your password. The Syrian government has deployed <coughs> just about every method known to man in an attempt to uh, get people's accounts. They've done man in the middle attacks, they've done malware, so uh, viruses and things that are download and target people, and they've done phishing. So beware of phishing. Uh, phishing comes in a lot of different ways. Remember, any time you give your password to someone or type it for a piece of software that you install, you're trusting the author of that software. So here, want to know who block or delete you're from MSN? So right there, that should tell you that that's a problem. It's a thing which is bad. Um, there is a secure way to do logins. The way a secure login works, you've seen this like, you know, login with Twitter or login with Facebook, where it brings up a little window and says, you know, this, this site is asking. You should actually never have to give your credentials directly to another site if it's properly implemented. What should actually be happening is, say you're logging in using, you're connecting, you're using Facebook to authenticate, <coughs> that is to prove who you are to another site. Um, it actually connects to the Facebook server and says, uh, who is this person? Oh, it's that person. So you, they, they actually don't get your password. And so if you change your Facebook password, that site doesn't have, um, or you revoke, you revoke it, right? So you go in and say, this, this app is no longer connected to Facebook, or this site is no longer connected to my Facebook account. They, they don't have your original password. It's, uh, again, it's some cryptographic magic. So basically, every time you type in a password, you need to think about who you're giving it to. And if you're giving it to someone, that is who they say they are. And basically, you should never be doing it. So that right there, I think you know, if you can manage to not fall subject to phishing attacks, that, again, I don't know the number, but that's probably going to going to save you more than anything else I can tell you tonight. So we've talked about some general principles, or, some, or rather some specific things you can do. Now I want to give you a framework for thinking about security problems in general, which is this. Uh, it's called threat modeling. The idea is, as we've seen, all of these people are collecting information. They're collecting all different kinds of information. You've got uh, state actors, you know, governments, uh, law enforcement, the secret police, whatever. You've got non-state actors, corporations, you know, uh, Google has all this information, Facebook has all this information. You have other actors, um, you know, hackers working for whoever who want to get access to your information. There are all of these th ways. And then there are all these ways you can get, they can get at your information. They can do technical means, so they have control of the wire and they can do a man in the middle attack or they're the, the telecommunications company. They work for uh, Skype, and um, because they're on the inside and they're working with that team, they can decrypt anything they care to decrypt. So you're not just trusting the company, you're trusting everybody who works for the company. There's legal ways. They can file a subpoena or a writ or, um, and get your information that way. Uh, then there's social ways. Uh, you know, I know someone who works for that company and they can give me that information. There's all these different ways you could get out of this information and all these different types of information. So you got to structure the process of, of putting together a security plan. So the first thing you've got to figure out is what you're protecting. Then you have to figure out who you're protecting it from. 
And this will vary, you know, all of this varies depending on your situation. You have to figure out how they can get it. And you have to figure out how big the risk actually is. Because if it doesn't matter if they get it, then you don't care, right? Or, or that will tell you, remember, you've got to keep the plan simple. And different types of plans will have different strengths and weaknesses. Asking what the risk is if they get different types of information. So there's different things they can get, right? They can get the content of your IM messages, which might be really bad. Or they might get who you're communicating to, which might or may not be really bad. Uh, and those are, those will pose different risks in different situations. And it's important to have the right tools, and I've given you a couple of them. We've talked about um, the, the, you know, using good passwords, using a second factor, which was, uh, which was this, this two-factor authentication or two-step verification. A bunch of sites are doing this now. Um, But it's also habits. If the security plan is too complicated, or you log in, you know, you you're lazy and you you don't turn on encryption for something that you should have, you can you can blow the whole thing. It's it's about having a consistent set of procedures. It's <coughs> not just tools. It's how you believe the plan is supposed. To, like, why do you think it's going to be secret? This is called the model, right? This is this is a, this is a security model. This is how you think it's going to work and how you th why you think it's going to stay secret. You have to have one of those. You're also going to have some anticipation of who the attacker is. And then you have to have the right tools you need. So in that case, they need encryption software. Then you have to have a plan, which is who does what and who keeps the secrets. So let me ask you a question and by way of getting you to think about who the threats are. Is Gchat is secure? Can you use it for your reporting work to talk to people? This is the sort of question I get asked all the time. The right answer is, it depends. Who wants to know? And how can they get it? If you're asking if is Gchat secure against the United States government? No, they can file a warrant. If you're asking is Gchat secure against a random person uh, who works at a, an ISP? Yeah, probably. Uh, that's because all of the connections to all the Google services are through HTTPS, so they're sent encrypted over the wire, so there's nothing someone in the middle can get. Is it secure against a Google employee? No. Is it secure versus the Chinese government? Anyone want to think this one through? Is it in China or not physically? Yeah, I mean, although you probably can't access GChat if you're physically in China uh, without using, uh, you know, jumping over the firewall. But Google doesn't have servers in China anymore. And international law is very weird. It's, uh, there are some methods to get a subpoena across international borders, but they're, they're complicated and difficult. So one of the questions you have to ask is, where does the company operate? Because if they have an office in a particular country, then that com com company is subject to subpoena in that country, especially if they have servers there. I heard that some companies don't want to establish themselves in Hong Kong because that, that rule is not fair. Um, yeah. And, and then they go to Singapore instead, where it's, it's much fairer. Yeah, what do you, what's the legal situation in I Singapore? I don't know exactly. Okay. But I, I know that Amazon is there. Mm -hmm. That's a good reason that they're not here in Hong Kong. Yeah, maybe that's part of it. Because they don't want to be compelled to give up information by the Hong Kong government. So, you know, I, you know, for example, you know, Google isn't going to tell the Syrian government anything. So if you're trying to protect a source against the Syrian government, then Gchat's probably a good option. It's very simple. Everybody has it. It's hard to screw up. 
the connection to it is always secure because <coughs> it's through HTTPS. And uh, you know, the US government, who can write Google a warrant, has no sympathy for Syria. So it might not be a bad choice. On the other hand, if you're writing a story about Google doing something bad, it might be a terrible choice. Right? So you have to think about all of the different ways that someone can compel disclosure, legal and illegal. Right, so again, the three things you got to think about: technical, hacking, technical wiretaps, breaking passwords, all of that stuff. Legal: is there a way I can use the justice system? You know, to you know, I'm a judge or I'm a whatever or I'm a cop or whatever to compel disclosure. Um, what country are the servers in? Uh, what country does it operate in? Um, all of this sort of thing, and then political or social which is you know, conning people, phishing attacks, exerting your influence in whatever way, bribing somebody who works at, at Microsoft, on Microsoft on Skype, whatever. You have to consider all of these different ways. Now, the, one of the things that we are not talking about We've been talking about information security. Information security is just one aspect of security in general. There's the offline world. Has anyone heard the phrase rubber hose cryptanalysis? Well, cryptanalysis means breaking passwords, breaking cryptography. Right? So normally this is about computers and mathematics and fancy stuff. Rubber hose cryptanalysis is you find someone who knows the password and you beat them with a rubber hose until they tell you. Passwords are not going to protect you against being detained or otherwise coerced. But there are things that will. For example, there's an old trick to get, uh, say, you're, say you have to get sensitive information out of, out of the country. So you've got to walk across a border with a flash drive. Wh and you know you're going to be searched. So what you do is you... Um, make up a random password that you're never going to remember. Use a random number generator. There's a bunch of line. You encrypt the data using that password. You email that password to your friend using your secure channel that you set up beforehand. And then you forget the password. And then, when they hold up the thumb drive and say, decrypt this, you say, I can't. I don't have the password. Now, they can still detain you or do other horrible things with you, but at least they're not going to get the password. At least they're not going to get the data, right? <laughs> so that's that's the thing, right? None of this none of this protects against physical force, <coughs> and none of it protects <coughs> against having your laptop stolen if your if your drive is not encrypted, right? None of it protects against having a conversation with someone that you shouldn't have had, trusting somebody that you shouldn't trust. There are still informers and spies and sources and secrets. Like this is not, this is this is sort of one little corner. But if you think about your information security in this way, at least you're not going to screw up in sort of the the. I don't. I guess it's not the obvious ways. You're not going to make beginners' mistakes about things which you shouldn't have done. There's a lot more on this. I recommend two primary sources. One is, and uh, it's in your readings, it's the Committee to Protect Journalists has a whole handbook of journalist security, which covers all aspects, including information security and, uh, and physical security, all kinds, really. But they have an information security chapter, which is very good. And the other is, uh, if any of you have an AP style book, there is a, a section in the back of the AP style book on information security, which I actually edited a couple years ago. And that has practical stuff. But all that it says is, um, you know, don't use stupid passwords. Know what a phishing scam is and don't fall for them. Know how many copies of things there are and where they are. 
keep track of, if it's sensitive information, you have to know where every single copy is. For classified material, back in the days of paper, literally every copy had a number on it, and there was a logbook which said where every copy was, and it was illegal to put it on a photocopier. So, so you kind of have to have that mentality if you're serious about this. Uh, and then the last thing is, when you're transmitting information over the internet or online in general, know who can read it. Ask yourself those questions. Anytime you use, oh look, hey, there's this neat app that I can use to communicate with my sources. You need to ask questions like, is the connection encrypted? Can the, uh, the company that runs the application get at the information? The answer is usually yes, they can. Almost nobody does security right, takes the trouble to go through, the, to go through it. And then, who are these people and can I trust them? Um, and not just, and remember, people can apply pressure to them too, right? So the threat of a lawsuit can be enough to make people disclose information that you don't want disclosed. So that's why the best security system is one where you don't have to trust anybody, which is why you, you should use things like OTR. And then, it's about habits. If you're trying to keep the identity of a source secret, all it takes is that one time that you connect to them without encryption, uh, and then the identity is blown. So really, you have to do it when you have the when you have a procedure and you have a plan. You have to make sure you use it every time. Oh, here we go. Yay! I wrote down everything I just said. So yeah, don't use stupid passwords. Avoid phishing. Um, <coughs> The standard is OTR with out of channel verification. Think about copies. And then the, the, the main thing before all of this is you, you have to know who wants the information and how they can get it. OK, the assignment. There are four scenarios here. Uh, situations in which you are trying to have secure communication. One in a war zone, one if you're writing about the CIA, an insider trading case, and working with Chinese activists. Um, I'll we'll talk to you in a second about who's doing what. You each have to take one of these scenarios, flesh it out, and then come up with a training plan. or just come up with a security plan. So you start with a threat model, which considers all of the things we just talked about. And then you have to, once you've done your threat modeling, you have to come up with a set of tools and practices. And, w and the big thing here, the thing where most people fall down is training the sources how to use them, explaining to them what they have to do. Because the sources always have to be part of the plan. And you know, software is complicated. And when you're in a situation where one mistake can blow the whole plan, that heavily skews the, uh, the good plans towards the simple plans. So that's the assignment um, because it's Chinese New Year um, and we don't have another class. Uh, it'll be due the 22nd, which is the Friday after. So you get, you've had three days to do every assignment except for this one where you have two weeks so I expect sheer brilliance from all of you. And that's it. Thanks very much for showing up. I know it was a, a rocket ride through the, through the material. <laughs> Certainly the most intense course that I've ever taught. And uh, I'm always around if you have questions. Thank you.